Welcome, great to have you here. This is a unique moment, a moment that unites all of us. We all face anxiety and loss. We all see broken systems. We all experience the impact of the climate crisis. This is a unique moment. This is a turning point if we choose to make it one. This is a moment to reflect, to learn, to share, and to co-create. And I invite you, I invite you to contribute. I ask you to contribute. I ask you to partner to fix broken systems. I ask you to join the movement so everyone can step into their change-making power. I ask you to nominate the next generation of change makers. And I a moment that you need to share your wisdom, your knowledge, your expertise. And I ask you to donate to support change makers. This is our moment to fix the world. This is our moment to contribute. Today is the day and you are the one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel on youth in the fight against racism and oppression. My name is Yannique Bird from Ashoka Canada support team um, in communications. And I'm supported today by Avi Phillips, who is our tech coordinator. And we're also joined by our lovely panel panelists who are two newly elected Ashoka fellows, Will Prosper from Montreal, Canada, and we have Sarah Hutenbren from Germany. Each of these fellows are doing tremendous work with youth around the issues of racial injustice and anti-oppression. And we're very excited to have this chance to hear and learn from them both. So today's session, I have a few prepared questions to get us started, but the meat of this is that we really wanna hear from you, audience members. So please use the chat feature on Swapcard where you'll be viewing this, uh, this stream to send us your questions. And our tech host Avi will be assisting in fielding the questions and I will be reading them for our panelists to respond to. So now with the basic housekeeping out of the way, let's meet our fellows. Um, I'll invite Sarah to go first and please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your work and your organization. Okay, hello Yannick and hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's really exciting. And I'm not on my own. If you hear some strange noises, that's my little hello. daughter who's uh, ill and uh, due to COVID uh, not in care right now. So, um, yeah, I'm speaking here um, in terms from Zweizeugen e.V. And Zweizeugen e.V. is an organization that um, aims to um, help young um, people, kids and um, teenagers to um, be strong and stand up against anti-Semitism and racism. And, and we do that by telling um, the personal stories of Holocaust survivors. So sorry. Now, now the biscuits are coming in. So the first one. Um, so we are doing that by um, telling personal stories of Holocaust survivors onto young generations in times when the survivors can't tell their stories anymore. Because we are, um, yeah, we are feeling that these stories you can learn so much from and you can gain so much courage and. Um, yeah, so much knowledge about what racism can do, what prejudice can do. And um, we really want to pass that on. So uh, the organization really try to make young people um, like witness of the witness who are passed this knowledge on and who are really empowered to um, take action for, yeah, for their generation. So in short, that's uh, what we are doing. That's incredible work. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm looking forward to hearing a lot more about your organization. And Will, would you like to tell us a bit about yourself and your work? 
Well, thanks for the introduction, uh, Yannick. We appreciate it. Uh, bonjour à tout le monde. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And thanks for introducing uh, your son, uh, Sarah, <laughs> and yourself as well. It's really, I'm really delighted to hear from you. Uh, I work for the organization. I'm a co-founder of Hoodstock. And it's uh, an organization that was founded following the death of Fred Villanueva, who was shot by a police officer in Montreal North, uh, which is a borough that has a lot of racialized community, that has a lot of, uh, it's really important it's one of the most impoverished uh, neighborhood in all of Canada and you know what we've decided to do is to try to get involved within the community within the youth and after the death of Freddy Blanueva there was a riot uh, the biggest race riot that happened over here in Canada it was back in 2008 and what we've decided the following year is you know what ways can we bring that energy in creating something not ne neglecting the fact that you know people are pissed off people are tired of uh, facing systemic racism uh, not trying to invalidate that it's validating that and trying to organize that uh, with positive action uh, with uh, just any kind of form of action so what we're trying to do is a bit like uh, coaches for sports. I've been a coach for all my life. So I've been coaching basketball. I've been coaching football. And I always find there was a void in what was building, what were what was there or lacking for engagement in the arts and political aspect. That's my son <laughs> as well. So <laughs> that came by. So I, I felt like there was a void regarding that. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to create or to build leaders because that was, that's what we believe is leaders build leaders and we build a stronger community and we support marginalized and racialized communities because there's a void right now in the media of uh, our communities and we're trying to build that a little bit more so that's basically that's basically it and i'm really looking forward for the question and the discussion that we're having excellent thank you so much will um, it seems like sarah has dropped out a little bit so i'll have some questions for you will uh, while we wait for sarah to rejoin and i guess my first kind of curiosity is the name hoodstock um how did that come about and, and what is the meaning behind of it well, it really started from the name Woodstock, of course, in 1969, when there was a gathering of the artists and people mobilized to fight not only against the war, uh, against poverty, against the inequalities. And for us, we just removed the W of the wood and we put the hood for a neighborhood. And we organized a social forum that has all show uh, that the social forum I also had a show at the end of it. So that's why we said, well, this is just like Woodstock, but the neighborhood version. And that's how it started, actually. So we had a bunch of artists that came and play. We gave a workshop on, you know, your rights when you're facing the police, your rights for housing, uh, your rights for work, uh, different stuff like that. And uh, that's what we tried to communicate. And at the end of it, we had a big march, another big protest in the community after the show, of course, the music show. And that's where we get the name from. Wonderful. I love the story behind that. And Sarah, if you're with us, um, I'm wondering if you could unpack this idea of second witnessing a bit for us. This is part of the name of your organization and it's a concept that is very core and central to the work that you're doing. So could you please let us know a bit about what that concept is and how you're employing it? Yeah. I would love to do that. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so the concept is quite easy because you have, um, we think that these personal stories, um, these really unique personal stories are quite a chance to get into history and learning through history but um, the survivors themselves aren't able to tell their story so um, we thought that why don't give next generations give my generation the chance to step up and become an active role in passing on these stories it's like um, yeah passing on stories you've heard that touched you so I you can imagine that like standing in a group of young people in a class in a school and I tell you the story of Frida who really touched my heart because she was a young girl, a student like me who had dreams for a future and wanted to be a physicist and um, that really 
um, got into my mind because she is not so different than me back then. She had dreams, she had friends, and she had the, her, her whole future before her. And then um, I tell the young people how all this normality of Frida's life, yeah, were taken from her. I'm and mom. I tell the young people what I'm that made with me that I'm I am, mom. yes, that, much, <laughs> that she really, that I am really sad about hearing that and that really touched me. And by that, I help the young people getting into the story of Frida. And by that, they really understand what, um, yeah, back then, um, treating Jews in Germany and many other countries in Europe um, meant to one single person. And I always experienced that that is a really new way for um, young people in history classes to learn about history and feel history and that they understand on a really deep level about what um, discrimination can do to a human being. Yeah. So it's yeah. quite easy sitting in a room telling from uh, um, telling young people about Frida's story and what this story yeah, meant to me as a person. Nicole, thank you for that. Um, part of what I think is, is a big part of both of your work is this idea, and there is this idea that if people simply know their history and you know, we kind of give them some factual training and knowledge about the darkest chapters of our history, that that will somehow lead to a healing or a prevention of the repetition. And it seems like in both of your work, you're really challenging that underlying assumption of just basically knowing the facts is not going to be good enough. So what is it exactly that's being left out of that idea? Uh, on just if, when we focus merely on the factual learning about history, what is being left out? And maybe we'll go to Will first on that and then come back to you, Sarah. Well, over in Canada and in, in the province of Quebec, uh, especially the history of black folks that came in even before slavery, uh, actually that came in uh, at the same time with Samuel de Champlain, uh, de Champlain. Uh, the history that was left out also about, you know, the uh, First Nations, the indigenous people living on this land. All these history were written off, it seems like from our book. And now, you know, what we feel like is that, you know, in our, our books in history also, you know, there's parts about slavery there's parts about these places where we put indigenous people in their school, uh, I don't know in French, but uh, the, uh, we, we took them off or their territory. And when they were kids at seven years old, we take them out for seven years, not speaking their language. And we brought them in boarding school and for seven years. And that was until the 1990s. And it had a huge impact on these communities. And something that's something that is never talked about in our book. And most of the time, you know, we're talking about the point of view from the colonizer. And it's erasing all these different things that we are still in some way, the legacy of it that we're still facing. And what we're trying to do is that, you know, we're trying to bring history back uh, the way it was because the way we are trying to avoid these conversation over in Canada, especially, uh, it's actually making us or opening the door for repeating history over and over. And that's what we don't want for sure. And quite often times we're comparing ourselves with the United States. And of course, Canada has a better image in the mindset of a lot of people, but people don't realize that, you know, for racial profiling, especially in Montreal, you're more likely to be racially profiled as a black person than in the United States, you know, in, on average. Uh, of course, we cannot compare the black population of Canada uh, to what's going on in the United States. When you take the reality of the United States, you have more black people in the United States than then you have Canadian, of course. So of course, you're going to see more and more images of what's going on. But it doesn't mean that, you know, we don't suffer racism over here, you know. We're trying to talk, tackle that conversation over here in Quebec. And it's really a tough subject because I remember we were trying to have a conversation on systemic racism uh, in 2016. And the elected officials said that we were doing the trials of the Quebecers if we're going to have that conversation. And it's always pushing us back with for not having this dialogue over here in Quebec. 
So it's really a tough uh, situation, but you know, what we're trying to do is that, you know, we're trying to empower the youth and letting them know their history as well, you know, because we have a lot of youth that is coming from Haiti as well. And we're trying to let them know, well, Haiti is the first uh, country that, you know, managed to win against slavery. And it's the only one in the history of the world. So if you know that, you know, you know that you have that within yourself and it's not just in uh, Haiti that happens, you know, I can give you names. I have Nanny in Jamaica, where she was uh, maroon as well. And she was fighting against, you know, the colonizer and there's many history in Africa, of course. So it's just letting them know that, you know, we're not only a page right after slavery. We've been there for a while. We've been fighting against it, and you know we have stories that that is uh, that needs adjustment, unfortunately. And it's the same thing through the hearts because we're trying to bring different form of dances. And when we express these different form of dances, we go back to the roots again. You know why you're making these moves, where it's coming from, why is it so similar? And same thing with the music. You know when you're singing a song and it's derives from uh, R&B, jazz, and stuff like that. Well when our ancestors were singing these songs and said, well, go down by the river, you know, it's nice, it's catchy, it's fun, but it's actually the way to let you know that, you know, if you go down by the river, you're gonna flee slavery, you know? So it's all these different things that are very important because music has lots of power and we're using that music. So it's just understanding what you're doing and what it does to your community. So history in many ways, sorry, I went, in a long explanation, but just to let you know that, you know, there's so many ways that we're using history uh, to let uh, the folks that we work with uh, to uh, understand where it's coming from. So there's the history within, within the racialized communities, and there's the history that we're telling the colonizer also in Quebec or the descendant of colonizer. That was an amazingly rich response. Thank you so much. Um, in particular, when you spoke about Haiti, I was like, yeah, because I'm a Caribbean descent and well, a Caribbean immigrant. And I remember what we learned about Haiti and like my colonial school system back home was not that Haiti was the first country liberated, but it was rather, you know, they made deals with whatever. And it was kind of painted as a very dark thing when really it's something to be celebrated. Um, Sarah, I would love to get your perspective on what we're leaving out when we focus basically on teaching our young people the bare, bare minimum facts about our dark chapters in history. I just um, clicked when you were said like, it's not just one page after this one topic because we started our, our project by realizing in Germany, you have um, a big topic in history classes is the Holocaust. So you always get the feeling that you learn a lot about it. Uh, what? But you always get this feeling of it's from um, the, it's a time period from 33 to 45, and then the war is over and the topic is over. So it's so isolated. And if when you um, look at a topic like that, isolated, you get the you can get the impression that's over and you have dealt with it, deal with it. And that's so wrong because it's, you can't just um, look at it and as a single page and not make connections to um, what, especially in my case, Germany is today. Um, you can see everything from the um, um, time of uh, national socialism uh, in our structures today, in um, the way people think. It's so deep in our generations right now that you have to connect history with the, yeah, with, with today and with what comes in the future to don't repeat it. I guess that's one really important thing. Um, and another important thing is we, I guess my history classes have been focusing a lot on facts and numbers. And when you talk about yeah, big mama. and dark yeah, chapters mama. you normally talk about numbers you can't understand especially as a young as a young kids but even now as an adult I can't understand what's behind these big numbers um, the way I got um, uh, a kind of understanding what that meant was through these personal stories so for me um, the heart and you mentioned it um, in connection with music was a new way to um, understanding a new part of it. And it showed me um, the pure dimension of this dark topic. It was so hard to listen to these personal stories and um, 
for me, um, having an, um, yeah, having a door opener like a personal story um, gives especially young people the chance to understand these numbers and what could stand behind it for one person. So I guess these two parts, like don't looking at history as a single page and connecting it with the bay and um, yeah, looking at it with at it with your heart is something really important. Hey, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, now, moving into the work that you're both actually doing, we have this kind of catch-all category called youth. But in particular, if we zoom into Hoodstock and Second Witness, what is the exact age group that you're focusing on and why have you chose to focus on this particular um, age group within the youth segment? Well, when we first started, we see we try to look at the age segment of 16 to 35 years old, uh, especially because it was um, the youth that was mostly engaged in denouncing, in fighting against uh, police brutality, because that's how we started. And with all that energy uh, for us, it was really important. And it's the people I knew, you know, it was people that I was around my age as well. So it's something that was more familiar to me as well. <laughs> And it was important for us also because they were always out of the conversation, uh, whether it was in the media, uh, whether it was in the school, uh, whether it was in political uh, aspects of it, whether it was economic, whether it was anything that you can think of. And for us, it was really important to make sure that they were part of the narrative, that they were part of the conversation, that they were leading this conversation instead of being led into this conversation. And quite often times, you know, growing up, up in Montreal North, what I've seen a lot is that, you know, there was a lot of ideas emerging from the youth that politician, that community organization were listening to and taking back and taking these ideas and building something out of it. And that was really frustrating for me because I've seen lots of my friends, lots of my peers uh, that were just feeling like they were being ripped off. And it's, and I don't want to make a bad analogy, but we've been ripped off since a long time, you know, our ideas and things that we're trying to bring forward and people have been benefiting from it, you know. So I call it the NGO approach where an NGO comes and look for ideas and they bring people from outside of the country to try to put in place these ideas. So, we see that quite often so for us we're trying to do the the opposite is if you have an idea we're gonna go with you and trying to develop that social innovation that you're thinking of and trying to make sure that you're the voice that is being heard that you are leading that project and we are showing that we trust in you to have the capacity to bring forward a solution for your community instead of the opposite. So it's a huge challenge as well, you know, because if we talk about systemic racism as well, uh, of course it has an impact on the person, on the schooling that some person might be having, uh, that person might have a criminal record because of it. So how do we deal with people that are facing the consequences of systemic racism? That's another issue because right now we're trying to engage people, not because of their diploma sometimes, we're engaging people that have uh, um, that have a criminal record, people that are most of the time being left off because, you know, of course the government is not going to hire them. It's going to be way harder for them to find a job. So if they're being kicked out of the society, how do we bring them in some sort of ways, their expertise, you know, they might not be what we call traditionally book smart, but for us, they're street smart. And that's something that we need to use. So we pair them with groups of people that are somehow book smart and street smart. And we try to accompany or facilitate the different initiatives that they're taking. So, so that's one of the role, what's, that's one of the mandate that we're trying to do. It's a lot of work. It's a work that is fun actually. And it's not always easy because you know, it's when somebody is broken, you need to work, find ways to unbroken them find strategies because you know and it's just like sports you know i'm going to go back to my example when you're in a neighborhood where you're growing up in a neighborhood where people are saying that you're never going to amount to anybody when your school teacher doesn't believe that she's going to be a success story well it's easier to fall back on uh, on uh, 
on the aspect that you are more accustomed to, which is, you know, some ways losing or not having confidence in yourself. So you need to bring little victory by little victory, little victory, and then you're going to go for a big win afterwards, you know? So you need to teach that as well. So it's something that we trying to have broken and sometimes that we're trying to build. It's always harder to repair a broken adult. And that's a bit what we're trying to do. So right now, you know, we used to work with 16, 35 years old. Now we're going even lower than that, you know, even in elementary school, uh, because we found that, you know, uh, sometimes we're not being taught what we're supposed to be taught, that we're not trusting the intelligence of the children. And I've kept on saying uh, lately that, you know, if we had more uh, presence in the media of the youth uh, instead of the adult, it will be a much better world because their wisdom is way better than what we're saying with the different uh, adults that we have in the place, especially politically speaking. So that's a long answer for a short question. Sorry about that. <laughs> no apologies necessary. Sarah, what about you? Yeah, I, I love listening to your uh, long answers well, because there's so much things I want to shout out. Yes, because we are, starting with the topic or the question was our focus group and we are starting at the age of 10 in the elementary school too uh, and i always get the questions like kids at that age they can't understand a topic that big so um uh, and i always answer yeah they can they understand with their heart they can't repeat all the facts from history but is that important i don't think so it's important they understand that you can't that you shouldn't treat people differently differently um, um, no matter where they're from what their religion is whatsoever so and that they understand perfectly and if you're talking about um, working against um, prejudice we um, you there there are some points in the um, in the uh, growing up um, 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 time of a human being where you have some points where you really can influence these prejudice because there are some times where like young kids are really um, um, yeah take these prejudice from their parents from their direct environment and then they grew up and they um, rethink their own thoughts and they um, um, redirect these uh, their own um, orientations to their peers and that's quite the time around 10 11 age and that's a time where there's a big um, big feeling of um, what's right or wrong in the kids. I guess if you work with these, you know it. If you tell them that someone is treating someone just because of skin color, just because of um, religion, they um, jump up, they stand with their feet and they say, why? I don't understand it. I don't ask my friends what religion they have. And that's such a powerful age. And of course you can work differently with older, um, um, people, but when you do something with a topic of history, especially Holocaust in Germany, and you invite openly, you always get the white haired people. Um, but these are not the ones who create a society in the future. So I guess it's really, really important to uh, take the young kids seriously and um, yeah, give them the chance to um, speak for themselves and to um, be part of the creation of content for themselves. So I'm really eager to learn more about what you um, uh, did in your work with the really young ones and how do you experience them as uh, entrepreneurs? Do you have a response to that, Will? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I don't know if we define it this way, uh, but we definitely believe in their capacity of uh, making us learn because we have a school system that is quite often time, a reflection of a master teaching and the people listening. And we're trying to change that, that focus, you know, where you have the students, whether they're 10, 9, 11 years old, bring their wisdom even to the teacher and trying to change or generate this conversation. And uh, it's just to have a different approach and we go as far as giving courses uh, or workshop uh, in hip hop because there's lots of affection for that culture of hip hop. And we're giving courses that, you know, is writing skills in hip hop and people hate to learn French, unfortunately in school, you know, it's really hard, something that's not easy to do. I've been through that already, but when they're loving something, 
and it's through the music they don't even realize that yeah they're actually uh, learning french at the same time and it's a modern form of poetry because rap is rhythm and poetry anyways you know so you're also breaking the negative image that people have associated with rap and you're also you know bringing uh, students in something that they love to do as well and uh, from there uh, we're trying to engage into this conversation that you just mentioned also sarah and uh, i i guess you know we, we are not there yet uh, at that point but it's something that we're definitely looking at We have our first audience question from Zoe, who asked, how can we structure our education systems to include all histories and how can we teach them with heart? Sarah, would you like to take the first go at that one? <laughs> In the moment, it's a bit quieter, so that's a good time. Um, Perhaps uh, it's easier for me to an answer to the second part, how can we teach them with heart? I would always say by being okay with so showing emotions. I always um, see that if you stand in front of a group and telling a story and show them that you are afraid of a topic, that you don't know the answer, that you don't, uh, that you're sad about it. And being vulnerable is, is such a big part of, yeah, allowing students to have emotions and to feeling a story. A really important thing by that is that's okay to have these uh, emotions, but you don't have to because everyone learns differently and you can't stand in front of a group and say everyone must be sad. So it's a really individual thing how to learn or get a connection to a story. So allowing to be vulnerable, but don't um, um, see it as a must would be my first answer to that second part. Perhaps, Will, you have an answer to the first part? Well, I'll try to do my best. <laughs> but I really <laughs> like what you just said. And, and for me, the relationship I had with school is also different. So for me, there's so many things that I, I'd be looking at the structure trying to change because, you know, being somebody that is, uh, uh, I won't say hyperactive, but I was hyperactive as a, as a child. Uh, school for me was a lot of frustration. Uh, it, it felt like I was locked up in a class for a whole day, not trying, not be able to move. And learning was something that was really difficult to do. So it left me with lots of frustration uh, within the school. And we have an old model uh, of teaching uh, of one teacher with 30 students trying to keep them sit down and listen for, you know, six seven hours a day and for me that doesn't quite work you know it's not a reflection of uh, the society the way that we work and stuff like that and it's not working with most of the students that is that are in that class and one aspect also that will be needed to change you know because uh anyways i was thinking about that at the same time that sarah was talking is that you know we have an individual approach in the school system that we are building you know it's you know you bring good grades for yourself and stuff like that and that's all that matters and you go all the way to you know college to university and it's always based on your singular grades and after that we wonder why we have an individualistic society uh, but we are not taught as a class how can we have a collective grade for the whole class because somebody that has a um, potential whether it's a, we call surdouance in french um, just a, looking for the right word in English, but you know, some people are, are more, it's easier for them to have better grades to have and you know, these different things, there's a word for that, you know, uh, uh, that person can help somebody that has, is falling back also, but that person that is falling back has also some potential. And how do we develop that potential? It's something that we haven't managed to do. Unfortunately, we only know that a person that has good grade, we're gonna develop that the best way that we can. But somebody that is not reaching that potential, what are we doing for these people? And I felt like for myself, that's a, a bit what I found that was, uh, I was being left off <laughs> from these conversations. So, so that's what it was. And that being said, yeah, it's get the class, you know, get it out of the class. Also go outside, you know, trying to do different stuff and just change the way that we are having classes right now because it's producing as well people that will be uh, unfortunately setting up people for failure for a long time and that failure is something that is hard to catch back on afterwards you know so we have to think about the structure we have to change that to make sure that you know we are not leaving any kids behind 
Oh, yeah, that's super important. I'm curious about um, for the young people that you're presently engaged with, and then we have another audience question. What are they reporting that they're most excited or hopeful about? In context of our projects or in? Yeah, in context of, of your, your projects and the youth that you're particularly in contact with. I guess um, the part that I'm most, most excited about is once, when it comes to what they could do when they get a place and a role and they could do something. Because when you talk about racism and everyone who's adult and has a voice or always get the impression that they have a voice, racism is such a big topic. You can't tackle it or it's, it could be too big. Uh, what could one do? And when it comes to young kids, children, um, it gets even worse because they are most of the time they aren't heard or they aren't um, be seen as someone who can make a difference. And when they get the impression, or when they um, see that they can make a difference, uh, as a simple example, we give them the chance to write a letter to the survivors to answer them, and then we show them how uh, touched the survivors are by simple words that could be just one sentence like I really like you I think you are a great person and they see a survivor in a video responding to that with words like I've never been seen as a human these men these words mean the world to me when young kids um, start perhaps to see that they can make a difference and that their action matters and they get so excited about it and they are sitting there coloring um, pictures on the letters, writing jokes for the survivors, and it's just a small start from them. You can build on it, but you have to show, I guess, young people that they could do something to change society. That's perhaps the part that comes to mind, uh, to my mind in this. Yeah, and to follow up on what uh, Sarah said, you know, for for us, uh, and you know, us, it's you know, it's in, in general. Uh, I, I remember what's really frustrating for school is that you know, you learn maths, you learn French, you learn uh, English, you learn uh, all these different aspects, you know, and you always feel like history. We've just talked about it, and Sarah mentioned it also. History has been left off, or it's been taught uh, the way that the colonizer were meant to do it, and it's been like that for a long time, you know. And we always feel like there's a void, something is not there, you know. And what what we're trying to do is that you know it's not just in history you know but we don't have access to arts and culture in our school system unfortunately and when they talk about arts and culture well it's going to be classical music you know and is it representative of the students that they have in their class not really as well you know so when we bring music a different kind of music you know uh, which is more something that they're used to uh, more familiar it's actually actualizing the situation of the arts in the school system. So I feel like we are way back in history also in the way that we're teaching in schools, you know. So so that's that, that's what we've been trying to do, like I've mentioned before that. And something that we've done also uh, with a group of young leaders that we had is that we had a session with a group and that's not something that, you know, I, I think that everybody should be doing. But what we've done is that, you know, we had like two people that looked like professional that came in the class and said that they were conducting a new story and they came from the university and they had an exam to show whether, you know, you were somebody that has, were more skilled or that you were somebody that was above our average for your intellect and people that were regular intellect, let's say. And that test was just, you know, what is your favorite color? You know, what kind of form do you prefer and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, we separated the class and that test was totally bogus, of course, but we just separate, separated the, the whole class. And there was a class with people that were above average and the people that were regular. And just looking at them, looking at each other, seeing what was going on and what they were facing, this discrimination that we see also in our communities, because it's exactly the same thing. You know, when you grow up in certain neighborhood, 
you are put in that corner where you're just a regular person and that you don't have any hopes or any dreams like that. But we had people that were in the other group that were never that never felt that. And when we said, you know, that test was just bogus, I remember there was one person that said, oh, I don't want to curse, but, you know, he said, oh, sh it's not. <laughs> you know, I, can't, I can't believe it. he was pissed because that was the first time in his life that he was considered to be somebody that was above average. And, and and I told them, I'm like, you're one of the brightest person that I've known. And that reaction tells me that, you know, you're not being validated enough or that you take lower of yourself. So that's how we try to bring that self-esteem. But also at the same time, we said, well, you know, everybody was looking at that group that was just a regular who step up and try to defend them and said, you know, that test is bogus as well. You were just happy to be sitting in that seat of being somebody that was felt like you were above average. So just the generating of that conversation is also a portrait of the reality that we're facing through systemic racism. So, and that free up a whole world for all of them. And the other thing that we do also, you know, the, the environment that you're gonna grow up in, we let them know that environment, unfortunately, is gonna have an impact on you. You know, sometimes you have to understand you know, that racism has some consequences. Your parents might not be there as often as they, they could be. Uh, you might have less food on your table because of that. You might have less money. You might have the least better condition housing and stuff like that. Your school system also, you know, is in the inadequate with the realities that you're facing. You know, you have teachers that are trying to do a fabulous, a tremendous job, but the reality is that they don't have services surrounding them, unfortunately. So the weight on their shoulder is even uh, is even harder. So when they realize that, you know, okay, I have an environment that is also a problem. I'm not the problem because what we are telling them is that, you know, you should be succeed, su su succeeding. And if you're not succeeding, it's because of you, you know, because there's no reason, there's no impact. It's like if the world outside had no impact on them, which is not true at all. So when we let them know that, you know, there's realities that you're facing that other people are not facing, unfortunately, now they understand that the weight is not just on their shoulder because most of the time what we do is that, you know, we whip ourselves because we're like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm failing and everybody's telling me it's my responsibility. No, there's more than that. So that's good to remove that weight off the shoulder. That was a really um, powerful story about that experiment that you ran with the with the kids, that's really fascinating. Um, we have a question here from Dylan, who asks, what effective strategies have you developed to combat deniers? In my case, I have family members who deny that systemic racism is a problem affecting everyone. Um, Sarah, if you'd like to take a shot at that one first. Um, for me, uh, the night, yes, I, um, I was just in the, just, uh, the question because we have, we more often face the, um, um, situation of prejudice that are spoken out loudly. Um, and then it's a really easy thing to break it down to personal stories and personal uh, from from the general level to a singular level and um, um, make it the topic because I generally um, work in an environment of a group and um, the best way to deal with it uh, I for myself found is to make it the topic of the group and to give it in the group and discuss it, discuss it in the group. Um, I myself haven't had the experience of someone denying something like the holocaust while talking about these personal stories so perhaps will you have a better answer and i come to it later it, it, it's a tough question so it's really because it, it's work unfortunately you know when we deal with the deny people that are denial in denial of the situation that we're facing uh, it's funny because we just had a recent incident where people in Quebec wanted to use the N word in their school book and they wanted to have that to the classes. They wanted to say, well, with teachers, you know, we should be able to use their, their word. And, and because of that, you know, we had a whole debate uh, in Ottawa where a school teacher used it 
to teach a her class. And then we had a teacher over in Montreal North in Aribasa that used it towards their students in uh, high school. And of course, they're, you know, telling them he was like, the end word this is something that we have in a book. There's an author that is a black author that used to have that hand word. And people were trying to defend the fact that, you know, it's their right to use that word. So they said it's academia, uh, academic liberty to use that word, you know, without thinking into consideration, well, what does it do to their uh, students uh, from black communities and stuff like that. And they, they're having that conversation within the white academia, all talking about it like it was something that was acceptable to do. And it's dragging you away from the work that you have to do on a daily basis to go into that conversation and tell them, well, you should be listening to our feelings. You know, you should have empathy. You should understand that the first time I heard that word, what it meant to be. And then we had a whole week of this conversation dragging us away from the way that we were trying to do because people were in denial, not understanding what was the causes or the impact that it had on us over in 2020, you know, we just had that conversation. And now I just go back in uh, just a few years ago in 2018, uh, we had the moment where we had Slave, uh, that was a theater play, uh, talking about slavery, where you had white people uh, playing the roles of black people uh, as slave over in Quebec. And now it was a question of artistic freedom, artistic liberty, you know, we should be able to do that. Well, the reality is that, you know, we're not present in that world as much that we should be. So you should not be doing that piece, you know, regarding that and you're reappropriating our culture and using it to make money, you know? And that was all the talk about cultural appropriation. And before that, we had black faces over in Quebec again, you know, I believe there was instances in 2015, 14, 13, and all these years for five years in a row where we were talking about that. And it was the freedom of expression again, you know, it's always going back that. So it's always pulling us away from this conversation and it's always coming back because people unfortunately that are in denial the reality is that they're really ignorant about the situation unfortunately and sometimes as an activist also you have to create these bridges uh, to activate this conversation uh, because otherwise you're just going to widen the gap and once you widen the gap you end up with some people that are elected official and i'm just thinking about the united states you know people that are doing dog whistle politic and it's really dangerous so and the danger has a huge impact on your community politically unfortunately and that's why unfortunately we have to go or we're forced to go into this conversation of people that are denial denying uh, systemic racism but do you um experience that they are listening and understanding because i got the feeling there are two types of um, people who are denying ones who don't know and then you can go with the facts and have a good conversation that took time, but you can educate. But I also have this um, really conspiracy, uh, conspiracy theory kind of people, and you talk and talk, and, you, and then you get the impression or the you learn that they don't want to hear, and then it's wasted, perhaps wasted time. But I don't have them so much often, I guess, as you have. So. Yeah, it's a great question because, you know, with, uh, you know, the reality of the virtual world that we're learning today, you know, if you just click on one word, you know, or just one like, then you end up following the news that goes into that like, and you believe like there's tons of people following exactly what your conspiracy might be, you know, so that's why we have a lot of people that are believing that the earth is flat, <laughs> in example. So if people are believing that the earth is flat, you know that you have to do a lot of work, you know, and how do we combat that, you know, we go and give a uh, training, I won't say training, workshop in uh, unions. Uh, we go in schools, uh, uh, talk about systemic racism. We go in the media to have this conversation because people have to see these faces. They have to see that we are present. They have to get in contact with the humanity that you have. And as a filmmaker myself, you know, I'm trying to do portray that in my movie to make sure that, you know, people are getting closer to you to realize how much bridge that there is between the, the, the two of us, you know, because as well, that's what I'm thinking is like somebody growing up uh, uh, in outside of the region, you know, because we have a lot of prejudice against white people outside of the region. But if that person is only following certain kind of medias like Fox Media, everybody knows what Fox Media does, right? But we have the similar kind of medias over in Quebec, you know, if that's all they're following, 
and you expect that person to be fighting a per person uh, who is fighting against anti-racism, somebody that is fighting is a feminist and stuff like that. I'd be very surprised that that person with everything that they're getting as information will be fighting against that. But how do we get to have different kind of information with these people? And that's a bit of the fight that we're trying to do to go and engage this conversation outside of the people that has been that we've been preaching to or people that understand we don't want to be preaching to, to the choir so i don't know how you do that with conspiracy because uh you know there's so many conspiracy i keep on hearing that all the time uh, that the Holocaust is something that never happened and stuff like that so it must be even harder for you i guess then the good thing is that we mostly work with the young people so i guess it's easier to talk to them or um, i get the impression it's easier um for us it's a big part of the work um, um, is that the kids always have heard something and put these information wrong together so that's a work that you really could do easily or just not easily but it's really it's it's helpful to get them the more information and to frame the information they got so they really understand okay that bit I got wrong or it's wrong just to use the word Jew as a, a bad word because now I understand or know the history behind it and it's for me it's a totally different story do that with young people or elderly who um, really don't want to listen to someone like me okay we have one final question for you both um, and then we'll have our little wrap up so the question is, given all that we've heard today and, and you know, the wonderful stories that you've shared and also the challenges that you're facing in your work, how can the rest of us who might be change makers in different domains or even aspiring change makers, what can we do to contribute to and support the younger generation in the efforts that are already being made? And what can we do to really support, you know, activists like yourselves in your fight against racism and injustice and oppression. Right, the first try again. Thank you for this question and this thoughtful um, yeah, time we got to talk about. Mm, I get, I come back to take young people seriously because I always see that they have so good thoughts and so great ideas and help them um, understand things that are not um, uh, that the, they always see like the injustice in the world and help them to understand where it could come from and encourage them to try to change it would be something one could do and with the younger generations in mind. Um, for my organization or our organization in particular, it would, I always see the best help are young people who are saying like, I want to, I want to be part of it and be um, coming and volunteer and um, give their knowledge and their time to the project. And by that, making it better and perhaps making something something new out of it, because we have more than 100 volunteers in our project, and these are role models for younger for the younger generation themselves. And this um, volunteer work, there comes so much good. So perhaps, um, yeah, think about what is your topic that touches your heart, because you see, um, with Will and me, that could be so different approaches. To, um, to the big topics like racism. And I guess everyone has their own heart or focus on their heart. There's something that touches you that you can't get over. So focus on that. Have a look if you can do something or if there's someone who's already has a project against it or around it and perhaps contact them and offer some help would be my first answer to that. 
Yes, uh, most definitely. I think, you know, nowadays, you know, trying to build solidarity is something that is uh, the most important thing to do. You know, uh, what we've seen over here in Quebec is that somebody can get elected just saying that we're going to reduce the number of immigrants over here. Uh, we're going to make sure that people that are wearing hijabs and stuff like that, they're not going to be in position of power that they're talking about, like uh, being school teachers and stuff like that. And that person never talk about the climate changes, never talk about the environment, never talk about different parts of that and because he was just trying to pursue some dog whistle politics well the climate changes the reality is that everybody that works on the environment you're also falling off the wagon as well because he doesn't need to talk about that to get elected as long as he knows that he has these politics in place these scare tactics that works with some kind of the population and we've seen that in many places many countries in the world unfortunately so that's why solidarity is key because if you're not taking part on these conversation well you know with the wave of immigrants that will suffer cultural uh, climate changes because of uh, uh, hurricanes because of whatever the reason that will try to come you know in our europe and uh, different places in north america to have a better life in the western sense of it anyways i won't go in that conversation but because of that you know that's going to happen as well so what's going to be the next policy is going to be well let's reduce the immigration let's block the frontiers let's make sure that we build walls and stuff like that and all these conversation are going to lead us in keeping on you know having more climate changes uh, because we're not going to take care of that at the same time because they don't need it unfortunately that's just their the, 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 the small reality and on a personal level you know you can do many things you know i'm a filmmaker myself so you know i've decided to create a little a movie uh, regarding uh, whoops i'm just in the wrong <laughs> i got too many things i had to go <laughs> at the same time that i was going on but you know uh, uh that's what i do I, i've done a, just a little uh film about that school teacher at that time uh, that was uh, talking about uh, systemic uh, racism and and that little video uh, I, I've decided to do it mainly because there was nobody else in the media that was interested by that story so I've created a movie talking about you know their realities the courage that their stu these students had in fighting uh, the inequalities that they were facing and because of that you know that caught on and then the media got on the conversation now we're talking with the politician now we're talking at provincial level but i stopped believing in the media for them to do something so we started to engage this conversation before you know it was just too late for them and also you know if you have any uh, marches on solidarity marches and stuff like that it's always good to feel that you're not alone that there's other people with you so when you know that you have other people participating on these kind of uh, events uh, that always feels good and that's another event that we organize against systemic racism right after the of the death of fred uh, 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 George Floyd in the United States, and we started to engage a conversation. Well, what are we doing over uh, regarding systemic racism? And that was a, at a time of COVID, and when it when it was at its peak and stuff like that. And we still felt it was necessary to engage this conversation in Montreal to talk about it, to fight against uh, systemic racism. So you know, anything that you can do, it's really important. Incredible. Thank you both for those very thorough and, and also very actionable responses to that question. And that is all the time that we have for today. So in closing, I just want to thank you, Will and Sarah, again, for the work that you're doing out there in the world, and also for being here with us today to share your incredible insights and your inspirational stories with us. Really appreciate you taking the time to have this discussion. Also expressing uh, gratitude to our audience members who sent us these very thoughtful questions. We really appreciate having your engagement here. Thanks to Avi Phillips for our smooth technological experience today. And also warm gratitude to the Ashoka Global team for organizing this entire summit and to the Ashoka Canada team in particular for organizing this event and another great series of panels that will be happening throughout the day. So be sure to check in on Swapcard, um, join in some of those uh, events that are coming up later today. So with that, we're gonna close the room. Thank you all again for being here and Thank you. just yeah, sign off and give a wave to our audience. Thank you, Thank you. so much.